Thanks, Ben Wall, and thanks everyone for joining us this Wednesday afternoon, at least in local time in Europe. Those of you are further afield, I hope you're having a good day, evening, or morning. As Ben Moore alluded to, my name is Dan. I'm Business Development Manager at Earth Science Analytics, and for the last year, I've been looking at how we can best use geosciences, data science, and the tools we have to power the energy transition. So today I'm going to give a bit of a loose and aspirational talk on what the motivations are, the role of technology in enabling this transition, and then just some examples of what we at ESA have concretely been doing in recent days. And I hope that that will encourage some questions or discussion from the audience and pique your interest in seeing future technical presentations. I myself am a geoscientist with a background in sedimentology, and long ago I was deeply involved in reconstructing past climates and the geological record. So I was very happy to be given the task of driving this webinar. And we'll come on to some of these topics later on in the talk. So I think our motivations at this point are obvious. It's been spelled out in big letters in recent days and years that to continue to habit the planet and have the lifestyles we are accustomed to and to be successful as a single planetary species and to a degree a multi-planetary species, we will need to power major transitions in the way we produce, store, consume, and even find and develop sources of energy. And to meet these ambitions in a time where it will actually be of use to the human species, we have to do this rapidly which means that what we have today has to be pushed into the future of tomorrow. And ESA's motivation, motivations here are relatively simple. There are things that we have today that we believe in 10 years, people will wonder why we didn't use them to develop new energy solutions, why we didn't lift and shift the fantastic work from 100 years of geoscience investigation of the world into hydrogen power, CCS, and more and things that concepts maybe haven't thought of to today that our data might be applicable. So our motivations are very broad, exciting, and we're very much up for this energy transition challenge. And of course, geoscience has always had a role in understanding the climate, starting with the very first sea level curve that was put together by a team of scientists in Exxon. And from there, we, the field of paleoclimate has described and detailed up to 65 million years of geological history of the climate of, any, of various uh, parameters from the geological record, even down to the permanence of ice sheets. And this vast as amounts of subsurface data was collected for scientific regions, and it is a drop in the ocean compared to what we collect from our exploration, production and development projects. Case in point, the photo here is actually the only dinosaur fossil ever found in Norway, which was found in a exploration well drilled in, in the Snorvit site. And what you see in the middle of this is a simple fossil of a uh, dinosaur knuckle bone. And this begs the question, of course, what can we do with the data we've collected today? What can we do with the vast trove of subsurface data from sample, from molecular level, all the way to huge mega merge 3D seismic data that, that can help us solve the challenges of the future? The challenge is that this data was not collected to solve, and maybe people wouldn't think to solve with it, but the challenges that need to be solved. And these challenges arrive from the Anthropocene. Now, I'm always pleased to show this slide because the geoscientist of the future is the geoscientist of today in a lot of ways. We are integrated across the world, as this lovely poster from the Geological Society shows. Every touch point of the world economy has a geoscientist somewhere in it, every touch point of social and ecological responsibility has a geoscientist in it. And I do believe geoscientists, in the way we apply the scientific method, the way we are taught, and what we achieve in thinking in long, deep time, 4D data sets, and the way a geoscientist is programmed to a degree, is the perfect mindset for solving challenges that today exist and tomorrow will be infinitely more com complicated. And I think particularly with the Anthropocene and the understanding we have to get of how the human interaction will change the way we have to think about our systems and the way we have to be more integrated in our approaches from energy to environment to 
even space exploration you know, the geoscientist of the future the geoscientist of today will be well placed to enjoy working on the cutting edge of that so the opportunity really is is actually very simple it is to take the expertise of geoscientists the measured data particularly in the subsurface case where we have these stroves of subsurface data connect it with a real challenge whether it's mapping a co2 reservoir improving the foundation placements of wind farms or simply avoiding geohazards and integrate those different silos of geological knowledge of well collected well structured data sets and of state of the art tools such as the advances in ai being driven by pioneers like tesla and facebook and uh, and uber to solve large and complex multi-dimensional problems because the size of the problem will not get smaller the size of the data will not get smaller every year the pace of the problem and the data will outrun the human's capacity to do it so we must take advantage of this opportunity to begin scaling it and building out and the technology can enable this transition by scaling our ability our speed to complete tasks and our quality in the case of this image classification task, today, actually, Eric, our CSO and myself were doing some work in this project, and in two hours, we had identified the uh, dominant lithology in 20,000 sandstone samples, described and ready depth registered for the wells to improve the stratigraphic framework. And it had the quality that was approved by expert sedimentologists, it was done rapidly, and yeah, we train the machine to supplement our abilities as two sedimentologists to handle this vast data set. And what this effectively means is the geoscientist of today, the geoscientist of tomorrow, has a huge advantage over the geoscientist of the past. They have access to tools that will give them a data-driven and independent judgment on what the properties could be in the subsurface. They have the ability to build repeatable, unbiased models that can be run by anyone and tuned to specific parameters. They can, of course, reduce the overheads through producing redundancies and working on multiple things in parallel. And the great advantage is you can repeat these studies rapidly, quickly, and in different parameters. Instead of filling our, our uncertainty with fixed values, we can fill them with a range of values. We can carry out Monte Carlo simulations within those values to give us a better understanding of the exact risks that are arising, whether it might be seal failure chance for a CCS site, disrupting a salmon farm with fixed and floating wind, or even problems with seabed geometry for, for, um, for cable laying. All of this exists today in disparate data sets, and we believe we can connect it together in the hands of the geoscientist to enable the energy transition. And as the ESA, we call this the digital underground. In the case of what we do now in the subsurface, we like to take a holistic approach to scale any physical sample data to a 3D or to a probabilistic volume to aid decision making. And is it acting in this holistic integrated approach and putting the data at the center that will be key to any success in the energy transition, as you will see from our upcoming use cases. And through this, we can accelerate the business decision making process, which is essential to carbon capture and storage to make the bring to make it sensible and make economic sense for operators to do it, for people to store the CO2 and for people to actually develop the sites. There are significant costs that need to come down, there are significant risks that need to be overcome, and the current processes today do not necessarily make economic sense. But they have to make economic sense by tomorrow. So I'm just going to quickly run over a few use cases that ESA have been developing over the last year, focusing on wind, carbon storage, and then something that is a little more out there, which is how we may manage the challenge of critical metals, particularly seafloor mining. Now, Offshore wind is well known that these projects are huge capital intensive infrastructure projects, and many of them are leveraged against first power generation. As such, any complications, overruns, or delays 
that will reduce that will reduce the efficiency or um, or miss the deadline of first power generation are catastrophic, and many of these arise from bad understanding or misunderstanding of the subsurface of the geological data of the oceanographic and atmospheric data. Most commonly, it will be simply not seeing a channel or a gully where you want to put your wind farm, misestimating underestimating the sediment hardness where you want to put a piling and as such you buy the wrong rig you buy the wrong drill then you've got a problem when you hit something that is more competent so all of this can be done much more efficiently through making sure that we have the best possible data in the best possible shape we have a way to rapidly and repeatedly interpret that data and then when the wind farm is operational we have the means to continue to carry out the repeat surveys and the repeat interpretations to ensure that the site is behaving as intended over its entire asset life cycle. And then that can inform future decisions, expansion, repositioning, or even projects elsewhere in the world that may be geologically analogous. And what this practically means is that using machine learning models trained on real synthetic data, we can quickly interpret these subsurface hazards to the wind farm, such as the gullies you can see in the seismic section in 3D. We can integrate geological sample data as, alongside code penetration tests. We can look at cuttings or images of the seafloor or other data sets to extract key parameters. We could even potentially look at core to look at how historically the rocks have behaved. And through that, we can integrate into a better digital twin and I said this in the webinar session this morning, but a key part, I think, of any new energy or energy transition project will be doing as much as possible in a digital twin before we touch anything that will have a lasting impact. Many of these projects will have life cycles beyond that of the human who has designed them. So it is essential that we find the means to simulate, to quantify and capture those risks that may live beyond the team that today will be running the asset. So in the carbon storage world, there are many parallels with the oil and gas industry. You are looking for a container of a certain size, but it is not an extraction problem. It's an injection problem, which means that you must have a basin level understanding of your prospect. And that means having an increase in re resolution from having a small postage stamp prospect where you want to store your CO2 to, to ensuring that Across the basin, you understand the plumbing, any connectivity, regional aspects, and anything that may cause leakage. It also has complications when there is infrastructure involved, when it is near oil discoveries, when there are other potential uses, which makes carbon capture storage at its core a real marriage between geology and big data challenges. And through the workflows we have developed in petroleum today, we can very accurately ascertain the, di the parameters required for, for identify a carbon storage site. But there are some tricks and features we can do to make sure that it is safe, that it will be useful, and that we can monitor over its life cycle. In this case, we did some re recently did, did a study on the SME higher storage site, which for those of you who follow the CCS news was recently awarded to Equinor. As you can see from the map, SME higher is very close to the Troll and Troll East oil fields, which are both large producing fields. It sits within a fault complex, the VET fault zone. The actual storage site itself is fault bounded. And as such, there is a risk of fault reactivation. And if the fault reactivates, particularly under the CO2 injection pressure, CO2 may migrate. The CO2 could migrate to Troll, to Troll East, or to places we don't want it. And that creates a significant risk, not just to the CO2 storage site, but to the, uh, to the other assets around it. So it is essential that we understand the fault geometry we understand the number of faults and we understand which faults are most likely to slip. So ESA were approached to use our machine learning tools to interpret the fault data. 
and I hand that to a geomechanical expert who then extracted the key faults and from there produced fault attributes. And we did this in comp for comparison with a human-driven workflow. And in a very short time, in two weeks, we had identified all the major faults. What we found compared to the human were three main things. One, where the fault picking strategy of the human had been, been to do it on a, a certain number of slices and inlines and cross lines. They had accidentally created a regional trend that was not there. The data driven approach did not pick this up. Two was that we found a higher density and resolution of faults using the machine learning tools of which there were significantly more that had a significantly larger slip tendency. And three was that we thought there was that there were potential challenges to CO2 storage that had to be investigated further in the 3D dynamic model and simulation. So through this application of a geoscientist and a machine learning workflow, we were able to fully de-risk to see the seals on what it will soon be a CO2 storage site that will come online relatively quickly. And another key tool in the CO2 storage side is, and in general, I believe this also has huge applications for, for wind farms, is digitalized cuttings data. Rockwatch GeoData are our partner here, and they are leading the way in digitizing cutting data. But effectively, what it means is that we have the ability to identify things from physical samples in areas where we otherwise wouldn't have coverage. Very few intervals are actually cored. Very few intervals of interest to CCS and wind have core coverage, but cuttings generally cover 90% of the well. So by creating modern and consistent image data sets and carrying out XRD, XRF, and other chemical tests on this, we can populate databases with properties of interest. And in the case of what you see here, Rockwash has been working extensively in the Southern North Sea to characterize the intervals for CCS, for the seal, for the reservoir, extracting elastic physical and geomechanical properties that, that uh, are of interest to really understand the storage dynamics there. And what ESA does is we take that, we use the machine learning workflow I described earlier to describe these samples on bulk and produce effectively depth registered ground truth data points that can be input into 3D static and dynamic models through our proprietary deep learning tools, creating a three month cycle that takes you from a physical grain to a digital twin of where you may be storing CO2, giving you the most accurate and actually the most intuitive read into challenges and opportunities that may arise. And I mentioned this earlier about the regional view. So practically what this means is that where we have very low well penetration, which is very common for carbon storage sites. We need to find the means to bring in analogous regional wells or synthetic data or augment the study in some way with the basin wide trends. And this is a key role for the geoscientist to understand how the basin behaves, to understand what the properties or what the change in the world dynamics will actually mean. Do formations pinch out northwest? Is there a change? In, is there some regional train? change of depth? Are there things to consider? From there, we can actually build synthetic twins or we can choose specific wells to tie into the survey. And what this gives us is a much more accurate characterization of specific features within the subsurface. And in this case, we were characterizing a storage reservoir here, which has recently been, been uh, awarded again in detail and they were having trouble resolving the actual thickness of the sandstone they wanted to store it in so we because of the low well penetration and because we brought in the regional trend we were able to actually find the heterogeneities in the reservoir and flag some issues that they otherwise would have missed and as a result they are now rerunning further tests and considering in more detail exactly what the reservoir looks like and because we were able to do this before a decision gate or before a go no go was made, they had the time to revisit and actually reconsider what they may need to do to develop this field further. And I'll just close on sort of the, I say the aspirational. The, the biggest challenge will, is critical metals. And here in Norway, there is a lot of interest in marine minerals. For those of you who may not be aware, Norway has the second most abundant acreage available and potentially the second richest in the world uh, marine minerals plays 
um, the MVD in academia and some industry in Norway has spent considerable time and resources looking into how to sustainably develop this. And the state of the art, at least in Norway, is that it has to be data driven. The data has to be at the center. We have to learn from elsewhere in the world. We have to bring in IADP data. We have to see what we can learn from petroleum. There are pieces from wind. There are pieces from ecological surveys that must be considered. But for this type of project to be successful, or for this type of project to have a license to operate, it has to be de-risked before a single machine touches the sea floor. There is a high level of social acceptance that has to be crossed, but in some ways is more challenging than the physical or the geological acceptance. And I think a key part of geoscience and the energy transition will be to marry the objectives or the resource hunger with society's expectations for the protection or the development or the you know the pres preservation of native or native environments such as these uh, ridges and smokers. So I can see a lot of applications for geoscientists in 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 the desk studies in the marine minerals and in oceanographic workflows here. And And in the uh, in in this case, you know, we see it as a way to uh, power power a sustainable and scale up, effectively, the hunt for rare earth metals, which is not an easy challenge in itself. But it's probably the biggest challenge in the energy transition is where all the resources come to power it. So, I guess in conclusion, well, my my goal today was kind of to touch on where we think the energy transition is going today, where it could go tomorrow, and what the role of digitization is. And we think energy transition and digitization go hand in hand. I don't see a more elegant path to achieve what needs to be achieved in the next five years than embracing some of these big data techniques and using the machine learning tools where they are, where they are appropriate. And we see that every solution must help reduce the emissions from production of energy, consumption of energy, and we must also consider storage of energy as well as the wider societal impact.